We rise and face the cross at the back of the church. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, graciously behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and delivered into the hands of sinful men, to suffer death upon the cross. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Good Friday is a day where we see our sin most clearly. We see our sin happen upon Jesus as he suffers and dies on the cross. We confess our sin to our Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and our neighbors in our thoughts, words, and actions. We have sinned against you and our neighbors in the things we have done and the things we have left undone. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. We take a moment for silent confession. God invites us to see our forgiveness clearly in Jesus. Out of his abundant mercy and grace, God gave his son to die and rise for you. Because Jesus shed his blood, we are forgiven. Because Jesus endured the cross, we are saved. As a called and ordained servant of our crucified Lord and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are forgiven by the blood of Jesus. Lord have, mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you endured the extreme suffering of crucifixion, shedding your blood so that the world would be forgiven. Keep our eyes fixed upon your cross, where you won forgiveness and salvation for the world. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Maybe see.
Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him for that which has not been told them they see and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten my God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away and as for gen his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 4 and chapter 5. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has in every respect been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence, although he was a son. He learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
We rise. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten of Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one Baptist for the remission of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, defend your church throughout the world from the assaults of Satan, so that we be kept firm in the one true faith. What language shall we borrow to thank thee, dearest friend? Lord Jesus Christ, bless all people who serve you in their callings and vocations. Grant them a measure of your humility and servanthood. What language shall we borrow to thank thee, dearest friend? Lord Jesus Christ, you are the great teacher of your people. Bless all those who receive instruction in the faith, that they might be faithful unto death and receive the crown of life. What language shall we borrow? Lord Jesus Christ, you possess all authority. Guide those who have been given earthly authority, especially our president, Congress, governor, and all those who make, administer, and judge our laws. What language shall we borrow? Lord Jesus Christ, you are the light that shines in the darkness. Shine your light upon all those who walk in darkness apart from you, so that they might see your love for them. What language shall we borrow? Lord Jesus Christ, you endured suffering and shame for, from your enemies. Strengthen us to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate us, and to pray for those who persecute us. What language shall we borrow? Lord Jesus Christ, you are the true vine. We are the branches. Feed us with your word and sacraments. We might bear fruit in keeping with repentance so that the world might praise you. What language shall we borrow? Thank you, oh, make me thine forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. John 18. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, was betrayed, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. And then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. And when Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. 
And then Simon Peter, having drawn a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Lord has given me? This is the word of the Lord. Jesus had just prayed this beautiful prayer prior to going to the garden. It was his high priestly prayer. The end of his prayer was, went this way. I have made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. This is a prayer that was filled with love. And then the opposite of love can be seen in Judas's actions right away as he premeditated or planned his betrayal by assembling a group of soldiers to arrest Jesus. This was no temporary weakness for Judas. Then Peter, in a moment of misplaced commitment, performed a violent act with his sword, in some ways acting like Judas by taking matters into his own hands. And Jesus would have none of this. He says he must drink the cup or bear the wrath the Father had in store for him. He had to go to the cross. Why? So that you and I would not have to drink the cup of judgment or bear God's wrath. This plan, Judas and Peter could not stop. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as Jesus prayed for his followers that his love may be in them, we pray that you will continue to send us your spirit, that as we try to take matters into our own hands, you would remind us that Jesus would drink the cup of sufferings and death so that we might live in joyful faith, knowing that you will keep us strong to the end so that we will be blameless on the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. We sing the first hymn, hymn 450, verse 1. And Bob, I wanted to mention to you that as the candles are being put out, just turn off one of the lights each time. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple, and since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves, and Peter was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I, I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered, If what I said was wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so they said to him, You also are not one of the disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. And one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter again 
denied it. And at once a rooster crowed. Religion that does not have Jesus as Lord or see him as Lord is not working for God, but against God. Caiaphas and Annas, who held positions of religion, high priests, who were there to intercede on behalf of the people, were not interceding on behalf of the people, which was the whole role of the high priest. Rather, they were key players in a shady trial at night, shouldn't have occurred at night. They tried things in secret, hoping to get a false statement out of him. And you contrast their behavior with Jesus, who would be the ultimate high priest. Oh, he would intercede for his people, as it said earlier in our Hebrews reading. Jesus was not secretive, but open about who he was. And then there is Peter, who moved from a violence that stemmed from misapplied commitment to Jesus, and then to straight up denial of Jesus. And though it was prophesied, he was not forced to deny Jesus. But now, three times, each more vehemently than the last, he turned his back on his Creator and his Redeemer. Peter now had to live with a conscience consumed with guilt. Jesus, who would cleanse him of that guilt, would now move on to Pilate. Let us pray. Dear, G Dear Lord, the high priest Caiaphas and Annas had little room in their religion for Jesus. Help us always bear witness and proclaim in the world our Redeemer Jesus, who would not be thwarted or stopped by the denial of Peter, but instead would one day assure Peter that his work on Calvary would color cover all his sin and cleanse him from guilt, too. As Jesus has done this for Peter, so will he also do this for us, and we thank you for that. Amen. John 18, 28 to 40. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters, so they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. And Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, is it not lawful for us to put anyone to death? Or it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death? This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered the headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. And then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? And after he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you again want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Half-truths are often seen as ways to justify our actions. You remember Adam in the garden? The woman you gave me, 
she gave me something to eat. Or the woman saying to the serpent, the serpent made me eat this. Are they right? Well, yeah, but not really. It's a classic half-truth, a way to justify themselves. Now, it seems from this section we just read that, that, Job, or that Pilate is very good at his job. He uncovered that Jesus was a king, albeit a king that is not of this world. But after some deft questioning, this became clear. And then Jesus said, if you are all about truth, you would listen to my voice. And Pilate then pulled the fast one, skirted the question, and said, what is truth? He was right in that there was no guilt in this man. He looked right in the eyes of the Romans. It seemed he was right to the world. But this was a half-truth. He was fooling other people, but he wouldn't fool God. An excuse that would help him skirt responsibility of Jesus by death, by offering Barabbas. Ah, Pilate, you're doing what humanity has done from the beginning, trying the half-truth approach. Yet this time you're dealing with the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. The destruction that resulted from this half-truth approach uh, would be seen on the cross. However, unlike Adam and Eve and Pilate, and dare I say you and I, Jesus would bear in himself full responsibility for our sins. Why? So we could now live with the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, both now and forevermore. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, in a world of half-truths, of trying to pass off responsibility, Jesus has come to bear the full brunt of the world's rebellion, including ours. Help us to live truthfully under the one who says you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen. <laughs>
So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. Now lest we think that Pilate was stone cold through this process, we hear that even he was more afraid, it says in our text, after hearing that the religious law said that one had to die if he claimed to be the Son of God. A religion built on half-truths, a religion built on our own goodness, sincerity, or some level of righteousness, inevitably leads to fear or pride. Pilate was afraid at this point, that's what it says. And while he aptly tried to get himself out of this decision concerning the life and death of Jesus, he could not. If one side of the Jesus-less religion is fear, the other side is pride. It is that pride that can be seen in the crowds crying out, crucify him. They're breaking commandment number one, the commandment behind all the others, by saying blatantly, we have no king but Caesar. Fear and pride. Jesus would deal with both on the cross. To those caught in pride, they will have to admit their need for the Savior, willingly or unwillingly, unwillingly to their own eternal destruction, that surely this was the Son of Man. To those caught in fear, the crucified and risen Savior brings assurance. It's he who says, have no fear, little flock, for the Father has chosen to give you the kingdom. God willing, then trust and not fear would follow after hearing this. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as Pilate became fearful and uncertain, and as pride overwhelmed the crowds as they cried out, crucify him, bring us to certainty of our salvation through Jesus, and take away the pride that, and replace that with a firm trust in Jesus and his word. Amen. Continuing with John 19. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Aramaic and Latin and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather that this man said, I am king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. And when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. Then this was to fulfill the scriptures, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. You know, the ultimate pride of humanity is to mock the one you should be on your knees worshiping. God knew that humanity tries to sit in the place of God, deciding on its own, I'll be in charge of good and evil, mocking the true God trying to replace him. In fact, he knew it so much that he predicted in the scriptures this scene that we just heard, the dividing of the garments, as if this was some sort of humorous excursion, a little bit of gambling at this point. Jesus would be king. But his birth, his life, his Palm Sunday entrance would show that he would be a different sort of king. A king who would not ignore, not mock, but rather absorb in himself all the irreverence of humanity so that we could live not above God, not beside God, 
but rejoice to be at the feet of Jesus, worshiping a Savior who would love us so much. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, you sent Jesus to be king of a kingdom that is not of this world. Your kingdom would gain a people for yourself, not through the weapons of war, but rather through the proclamation that repentance and forgiveness of sins is found through King Jesus. Send us your Holy Spirit that we might spend this life and the next worshiping at his feet. Amen. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and his disciple, for whom he loved, standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus said, Receive the sour wine, he said, It is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. In this section, in these last phrases, Jesus continues to the very end to be obedient to God's law. He took seriously the fourth commandment to care for his mother and asked his disciple John to take over when he could not, at least at that instance. After all, he knew that a mother losing her child in any way, but also in such a public way, would need tremendous help. In the next phrase, we see that he is fully human when he says, I thirst. He's parched. He knows and took in himself every sickness, every sorrow, every tear, all that we face. He absorbs it in himself. And finally he said, it is finished. It looks like at this point all is lost. But this proclamation of the gospel means for us that all is gained. All that we needed for our salvation would be full and complete at his death and subsequent resurrection. Calvary was enough. Redemption is ours. It is finished. He did it. And he said it. And you can't get clearer than that. Let us pray. Dear God, as we look at our future journey, we are thankful that through our crucified Savior, we have one who walked the path of sorrow, pain, and grief before us, so that we would not have to bear these things by ourselves. Thank you for assuring us that when Jesus said, It is finished, our connection to him, our redemption, our hope is sure and complete. Amen. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for Sabbath was a high day, 
The Jews asked Pilate that the, their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness, his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled, not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. And after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh, aloes, and about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. As we heard, Jesus' death was not prolonged like the others who were crucified with him which is why the prophecy about his bones not being broken would come true. Breaking his legs wasn't necessary, he had already died. The Apostle John leaves no room for a less than dead Jesus as his side is pierced with the sword. Here you have the fifth wound of Jesus. Do You know that on this altar, and I think on most altars, there are five marks signifying the five wounds of Jesus. There was no mocking at this point after this, and those who saw the crucifixion bore witness to the truth of these events so that people would place their trust in him. Two prominent Jewish individuals, Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy man, and Nicodemus, a Pharisee, who came at night, would make sure his body was cared for, neither of them knowing what would happen a day later. Let us pray. O oh Lord, as Jesus' body was laid in the tomb, Remind us always that your death is the means to our life. Prepare us to rejoice and always proclaim the wonders of a suffering, dying, and yes, rising Savior to a world that is dying to hear it. Amen. Heavenly Father, we have followed your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, to the cross. Strengthen us as we face our own mortality, knowing that just as we have been united with Jesus in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.